I'm Julie Bartke with this Senate update. Legislation was unveiled on Thursday to halt the potential extinction of the family farm. Senate DFLer Lyle Coonan was joined by Republican Representative Steve Draskowski to detail the Minnesota Family Farm Protection Act. They did so in a news conference on Thursday. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for coming. Um, we're going to talk today about the uh, Family Farm Protection Act uh, that we are uh, authoring, actually introducing today in both the House and the Senate. Um, and I think as many people know, Minnesota property ta tax increases of the past few years are on the minds of many Minnesotans. Over the past few weeks, I have been listening to people from all across Minnesota as they contemplate the accruing costs of local government and the impact that they are having on their families and businesses. Nowhere is the impact of soaring property taxes more evident than in Minnesota's agricultural community. I have been hearing the strong and concerned voices of farmers in southeastern Minnesota for the past two years. As I travel the state, this most serious concern is definitely spread throughout rural Minnesota. In those communities where school or other local government construction referendums have been held in the past few years, the economic burdens being placed on farmers have become unbearable. Over time, a significant shift has occurred, directing more and more the burden for paying for local government construction bond levies upon an already overburdened farming sector. Because of these dynamics in Minnesota's egg communities, when today's construction bond levies are passed, over the life of the bond, farmers pay $10 for every dollar paid for by their city cousins. The Family Farm Protection Act brings a new and fair approach to local government construction levies. Under this bill, when a school, a county, a city, or a township passes a construction levy, a family farm will pay property taxes toward the new building based only upon the values of the ho their house, their garage, and one acre of land, rather than across every acre of land on the farm. This places farm families and non-farm families in position to contribute equally to the new project's costs. This approach will help preserve the future of family farms as we have especially heard about the pressure that construction levy burdens bring to smaller farming businesses. Over the past few decades, Minnesota has struggled continuously with the question of fairness in school facilities between rural communities and their suburban and urban neighbors. This bill will contemplate the state's current and future formula and approach to school debt equity aid, helping to extend more opportunity for rural students throughout Minnesota. We will be working with farm leaders and school leaders and school leaders to pattern the future of this aid program in a way that meets the mission of equity and fairness expressed in Minnesota's constitution. Um, with that, uh, I will uh, uh, yield next to uh, my colleague in the Senate, um, Senator Coonan. Okay, thank you, Representative Dreskowski. And uh, I think this is a really important bill for rural Minnesota, of course, but I think it's also real important for the interests of just fairness and how we uh, structure our tax system. Just for a little background here, in the last 10 years, property taxes on uh, homes have gone up about 23%, on commercial industrial property about 55%, and on farms 132%. And these are statewide numbers. I know it'll vary from the different parts of the state. But you can see the drastic uh, jump in uh, what's happened with farmland. And I know that the reason for that, of course, is the increase in farmland values. But uh, the... Um, these responsibilities to pay these taxes, of course, come from income. And I know that agriculture has had some good income in the last few years, but it's cyclical. And now uh, the situation on the farm isn't near what it was the last few years. The farmers are really struggling now to try and, and turn a profit. And with some commodities, uh, at least at uh, current prices, aren't able to do so. Now, the, like I said, these are statewide averages. Uh, the farm uh, tax liability has gone up 132%. There are some parts of the state that uh, where farmland values have gone up even faster, and, and we see uh, uh, the liability go up much greater than this, even double that amount or better. 
And so there are really some uh, wide variations around the state. Now, this bill is the first step in addressing the problem. And if you let, we'll talk about school districts for a minute here. With school districts, there's a difference on how this would affect each school district too, depending upon the mix of the property classifications within that district. And so there's a lot of these things we need to work through yet. But I think the important thing to take uh, back from all of this is that what we're striving for here is fairness uh, in the end. And so as Representative Draskowski and I work on this, I'm hoping that, that, uh, that we can reach a point where we, uh, the uh, system of taxation is uh, much fairer than it is now. Uh, again, thank you all for coming, and, and also thanks to Representative Draskowski uh, for working with me on this. Great. Well, uh, good afternoon. I'm Doug Peterson. I'm Minnesota Farmers Union President. I want to thank Senator Cullen and, and Representative Drakowski for authoring the bill. Um, Minnesota Farmers Union has uh, a long-standing policy of supporting good education and also tax fairness. But in specifics to this uh, bill and property taxes, we must remember that farmers are price takers, not necessarily price makers. And Minnesota Farmers Union supports exempting all ag land um, from that educational bond and leveling, both and both the building and operating, except for the house, garage, and one acre. So the fairness point that the representative and the senator talked about uh, goes to the heart of people in rural Minnesota on ag land taxes. Uh, at some point, the legislature decided that for operating levies, the house and garage and one acre. Uh, what we're saying is that for capital improvements, levies going forward, it needs to be the same or fair. Uh, this issue, frankly, has pitted uh, farmers against their city cousins in the name of education, um, resulting in uh, many cases of failure to pass much needed improvements that have resulted in farmers paying tens of thousands of dollars more in ta property taxes for their school district. I want to thank the authors for um, introducing the bill and uh, I know this is going to be a work in progress, taxes in rural Minnesota and the responsibility of ag land versus city, uh, house garage and one acre is going to be contentious as they move through the legislative session, but we are here to support the bill. Thank you. My name is Kevin Papp. I'm president, Minnesota Farm Bureau. I'm also a corn and soybean farmer in southern Blue Earth County. Um, we raise corn, soybeans, and boys, boys being the most important crop. And the fact that you do raise that family on the farm in rural Minnesota, um, it's important. And every Farm Bureau member, I think every citizen of Minnesota understands education, a strong, solid education is vital to this state. So we need to do that. Our policy in Farm Bureau is very clear, supporting education. You also have to support education finance as it looks at new buildings and bondings. Uh, not only as a farmer do I uh, get to live property taxes by twice a year writing out those checks on that property that we own, or as if I'm renting ground is, as part of the land rental payment, um, I also get to live it as a, in a school district. Um, our particular school district uh, was one that passed a referendum, but it took seven times. And what we don't want to do is we don't want to pit rural versus urban, whether it's in my community of Vernon Center or any place else in the state. So anything we can do to help further education is important. Property tax, we didn't get here overnight, but we've got to do something to be able to continue to have a strong, solid education system. We support the authors. Uh, we've talked about house, garage, and one acre in Farm Bureau for years as we started with the operating and now would work to that towards bonding. So uh, appreciate again the work, and this is something that was important enough to Minnesota Farm Bureau, we actually put a task force together as we're hearing from more and more of our members about the funding of education through school bonds. Thank you. We'll take questions. Uh, Who, pays? Who pays for this? Um, expound on your question down a little bit. Well, if so, farmers don't so pay the $10 for every dollar, explain to what, us a little bit what this, pay. what this does is it, it uh, creates a new starting point, a new 
um, uh, approach to paying for construction levies going forward. It does nothing to those that are already in place. And so uh, if this is adopted into law, um, at the point at which the bill becomes effective, uh, from that point forward, any new levies passed would be affected and calculated according to what this bill ends up prescribing, which basically moves uh, from a net tax capacity calculation to a referendum market value calculation. That's how the bill uh, operates. But the city cousins would end up paying more under this bill than they would under current law? If you would look at the same referendum in the future um, after this bill is passed, uh, before it is passed, the answer is yes. Um, so, if, you know, if you, I think we've, we passed around some handouts. Did you get copies of those handouts that came around? It did look at those. And so uh, I think what we're maintaining is over time, and you'll see from some of the graphs, uh, that over time the uh, farm, the, the, the responsibility for paying for this has shifted more and more to the farm. And while their um, liability has gone up, the city's uh, folks have gone down this will bring them even again. And almost, I mean, I, I can't say perfectly even, but pretty darn close. And, and that's what we're striving for is fairness. And it's also real important to note that if this, and we're hoping it does pass and get into law, that, uh, that uh, the voters will know ahead of time what they're voting on, so it won't be a surprise. You know, each, uh, each school district, as they offer their proposal to the voters, uh, they'll know ahead of time what they're voting on. Uh, for, this might be Ag Land 101 for us, but tell me the difference here between the way you value, you value property. Uh, you're talking about different forms of valuing the property. Is it market versus production, or how is that? Um, it, currently, it's calculated on, and um, Mr. Hines is here if we get into the details about this, but as you know, property tax is very complicated. But currently, it's on a net tax capacity base. It changes it over to a referendum market value base. And so under the referendum market value base, the, the acreage on the farm beyond that one acre that the house sets on is not part of that base. It's not included in it. So the farm would pay on their house, their garage, and the acre that it sets on. Very similar, very similar to somebody in town who had a house and probably less than an acre, but you know, their lot on their particular city block. But currently ag land is, is it uh, appraised based on market value or based on crop production or, or it's it's based on market value and that's what uh, the senator was talking about earlier right and it's actually based on sales uh, in each county they keep track of the sales and, and what level the sales are at and uh, uh, so it's actually based on the actual sales and I think uh, there's a formula where they throw out the, the lowest uh, sale or lowest 10% and throw out the, the highest so you can take the extremes out of it but it is based on, on sales. And the way the system works, maybe I'm getting a little off subject here, but it takes a couple of years for that to work into the, into the, the, the paying of the tax. The first year, the information is collected. The second year, it's sent out in the, in the valuation statements. And then the next year is, is payable. So it does take a couple of years to work through. Wouldn't the same disparity exist for a school district operating levy? And, and would you want to correct that as well? Uh, that was that was changed, uh, uh, Tim, in 2001, and I, that's actually what uh, Kevin had mentioned when he was up here in 2001. As I remember, uh, or have heard anyway, uh, there was the proposal to put it to house garage and acre on both the operating levy and the construction levy, and what survived was the operating levy, but the construction levy fell out of the bill. And so right now we've got operating levies based on uh, referendum market value and house garage and an acre and construction levies based on net tax capacity still. So this, this aims to bring them both together and, and base them both on the same approach. That's right. And, uh, you know, th this bill has been introduced in the past. In fact, I've carried this myself a few years back. It could never get traction. But I think with the the disparity in the valuations now, in other words, how fa fast farmland values have gone up, uh, that it's getting a whole new attention again now. And so we're going to be taking another run at this again. And if, if you didn't get copies of the handouts, there's a handout that shows a graph going up sharply. That was sent to me yesterday by a real farmer in Minnesota 
They graph that out on, the, on their own. Those are their actual numbers from their farm. Uh, a full quadrupling from, if I remember right, 15,000 uh, per year to 60,000 per year uh, in 10 years, quadrupling on their farm. And that's, that's the type of dynamic we're seeing and hearing about, and these folks who farm um, are experiencing. Gentlemen, I don't know if, there's, if you have any hard data on this, but is there, is there anything that you've seen to suggest how many school building referendums have failed in rural Minnesota because of this disparity in the past few years? I, I, we don't have anything with us today. Um, this, this institution here has a capacity to generate that, and I fully suspect as we come forward and have hearings that those types of details will come forward. Uh, but we do certainly have anecdotal evidence of uh, the school Pine Island, right in my district. I don't know. Uh, they tried four, five, six years in a row to get a referendum passed, and, uh, uh, and it, kept, it kept failing. Uh, largely because the farmers were afraid to vote for it on average because it was so burdensome to them and it just ended up being I think as one of um, the the farm organization leaders talked um, getting to be almost pitted between between rural and city and that's what we want to remove uh, that dynamic uh, in rural Minnesota so that that we have people who are voting for referendums uh, equally uh, responsible for the outcome and, and um, equally contributing to those school facilities. And it does, again, it also applies to county and other facilities uh, that would, would be levied as well. Do you know how many such votes are held? Uh, say that again, John. Do you know how many of those votes, like the construction votes, are held, schools, cities, counties? That's in this institution too, but um, we don't have, we're pretty organized today, but we don't have that. <laughs> well, this is a row <laughs> It doesn't seem like this would make it any easier to pass a, a, a referendum. It might make it even harder. But you can, can see that? Or? And, and again, it varies from school district to school district, depending upon their current mix of property tax class. And, and then, of course, uh, if you have a, a district that has a lot of people the biggest part of their voting population lives within the city limits and doesn't own farmland, where a smaller part um, of the, uh, the voting population lives on the country and owns farmland. This switch might make it tougher. I'm not going to argue that. Uh, but I'm also going to argue that it would be fairer. And so, uh, you know, each district is going to have to look at that. And of course, we will be considering that too as we work on, on this bill. The bill will probably have two main stops, it'll be the tax committee and the education committee, so all these things will be discussed. But again, getting back to your question, you know, I just gave you an example where it might be tougher to get it passed. There could be examples where it would work the other way too, just depending upon the population mix and the mix of the property within the district of the property classification. Yeah, and I'll just add, I, I would suspect that farmers on average are going to vote in higher numbers for construction levies under this and I've heard anecdotally from many farmers who have said you know what I don't have any problem paying my share of these construction levies we support education as much or more than anybody else but this 10 times as much as somebody else who has the same vote is not working out and so that's kind of where they're at and I suspect uh, if this is enacted in a law you're going to see farmers vote for uh, levies in greater numbers than they are now. I've heard um, some folks kind of bring up the idea of maybe allocating some state dollars to offset some of the shift you know, that's going to occur in this to help reduce the homeowner's burden and the business owner's burden. Is there, did you guys give any thoughts on that? Is that something you looked at? Or? Well, it's something I'm sure we'll be discussing as the bill moves through the committees. And, you know, that's something, you know, for me to stand here to say that, yeah, we're going to do that or, yeah, we're not, I can't do that this early, but I'm sure it'll be part of the discussion and, and probably should be. Um, there's all, I've also heard the idea of, of uh, caps also. And, of course, that would, you know, sp spread some of the burden, too, in a little bit different way. Where we're going to end up, I just don't know at this point. Uh, you know, we got, there's a lot of work to be done on this bill yet, um, including... The, the way equalization currently works too. So uh, there, you know, we have a, this is a starting point. We have a long way to go yet. Yeah, we have we have Heather talked with uh, with many of the school groups, and they are willing to embark on this journey with us. 
to take a look at this and make this work. Uh, certainly moving this from one tax base to another will inherently uh, provide for a uh, redefinition of that debt equity aid and how that is distributed. It, it, will, it will flow uh, just by definition more to those rural districts where that land base disappears from under the change. Um, but we are um, looking to, and Grace uh, from the school boards is here in the back of the room and I talked to her last night. Uh, we are going to be meeting in the next week or so uh, really very quickly with them to take a look at what that means uh, under this bill um, and what, uh, what that equation, uh, it's, I, they did have the computer screen in front of me and I did try to follow along, but um, you know, it was, uh, it was, it's, uh, it's very complicated and um, we hope to work with them and uh, house research upstairs and others to, uh, to come up with something that works. And, I, and the Senator and I were talking actually on the way down, um, this whole discussion around the Capitol too, you'll, you'll see and hear about uh, providing funding for facilities. I think, uh, and Grace and I talked last night, uh, there is a constitutional man mandate for fair and equitable funding in our state constitution. And um, that has been pushing back for years as there's been court challenges against that, really specifically looking at our rural areas and suggesting that, that our rural areas do not have that capacity uh, to build uh, school facilities that you do in some of the suburban communities just inherently by their tax base definition. So the goal is uh, for us to take a look at that and I think these two issues are gonna probably, uh, I'm speculating, to come together in this bill as we, as we move on through the session. I'm not seeing a lot of those urban and suburban legislators standing up here <laughs> to support this. And rural legislators are in the minority. What chance does this really have of getting through? And what do you have to tie this to to get them to support it? Well, I, I'm going to argue that we were, the bill is about fairness. And it, so hopefully we, we can play to that part of it. And you're right, this bill, uh, because of rapidly incre increasing land values, it skewed everything to put more of the responsibility on farmers. And, uh, you know, if you're not a farmer, that's great. You, do, you know, you end up paying less uh, share of it. But, but w what the bill is really about is to fairness, and we're hoping that the, you know, everybody will understand that issue. And I, Don, I mentioned that constitutional mandate, and there have been court decisions uh, really bucking up against that around this issue. And I think this is actually going to be an opportunity and a platform for us to address that issue. And that alone, I think, will provide, I think, some of that additional momentum that um, I'm uh, guardedly optimistic that we need for this bill to pass. Do you have any urban or suburban people in your bills? Uh, Representative Run Runbeck's on in the House, and we didn't, and, and I didn't, uh, I didn't go around the whole house floor signing people up, but uh, so I, we got one for sure. <laughs>